Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha, and obviously this is my husband, Jonathan. He has an amazing word for you, and I'm so, I'm really excited here because he is by far my favorite pastor. No offense, Pastor Mark. I know that you've got a word, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to share a little bit about what we do really quick before uh, Jonathan brings the word. Um, we are missionaries. We work with Overland Missions, and what we specialize in is remote missions, and it's not that... Ministry in the city isn't important. It absolutely is. It's just that I feel like there are less people who go out into the far reaches of the earth to get those same people, right? So what our passion is, is to go out into those places that are physically and geographically hard to reach and share the gospel to those who are just as deserving of the gospel as everyone else, right? So what we are doing this year is we're going to go to Brazil, and we are going to travel about, I think by the time we're done, it's about 30 hours down the Amazon deep into the river, sharing the gospel with the people who are there who have not heard the gospel yet, bring them Jesus, (laughs) and then set them free, right? Something that really struck me about what we're saying today is we have such a grace in America to gather together, which we will never take for granted again, (laughs) gather together, praise and worship Jesus, We have access to him for him to take us out of our Egypt. We have access to him to run and be free. We have access to him for him to rain down on us and heal us of our tribulations, deliver us from the things that we're struggling with. But yet there are those in the Amazon that do not have access to that. There are those around the world who during 2020 were trapped in quarantine without the hope of Jesus. And if that doesn't do something to you, I would ask that you get into your prayer closet and deal with God with that because that's something that should stir your spirit. That you should have the desire to bring to others what Jesus has done in your life. And so what we do is we offer you guys the opportunity to do that. We'll be here hopefully another week or so. We'll be out in the lobby. Please come and speak with us. We'll be traveling for about two weeks down the Amazon. Um, We'd love to invite anybody else who would like to come with us. Um, really just share the gospel, be changed, see the world change, right? That, that's what we're called to do. It's not a suggestion in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples, to go and be a witness to the ends of the earth. That's an actual command. And so we just want to give you guys an opportunity to do that. We want to encourage you guys um, in that. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to my husband. Thank you, baby. Mm, give me a hug. She said that I'm her favorite preacher. Well, she's mine. (laughs) She does a far better job of communicating Jesus um, than I feel like I ever will. She's incredible. And I'm and I'm blessed to have her by my side through this life. And our son who's in the nursery. um, He's going with us and we we're just excited to bring Jesus to people. Um, I'm going to pray first. Is that okay? Can I pray first? And then we'll get into what the the message, the word that God has given me for you guys. Father, we want what you want for this place. We want your words, not mine. And we want your move, not ours. So we pray that you have our ears and you have our eyes and you have our full attention as you should. There aren't enough words for us to be able to pour upon you of who you are. We try and we come up short every time, but we love you. And that's all that we can say is that we love you for who you are and for what you've done. Speak to us this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. So... Pastor Mark approached me about having um, an opportunity to speak the word to you guys, and and honestly, I was I was extremely excited, but I was also extremely nervous. Not because I, I don't want to, you know, I'm nervous because of the amount of people here. I've I've preached in front of multitudes before in other countries with a language barrier. That's not something that kind of daunts me, but it was the message that God had already been dealing in my spirit to deliver to you guys. You see, sometimes we get really awesome, joyful, encouraging messages that are poured upon us and it encourages us and it lights a fire within us and we can go forth and conquer in his name. And yes, God never gives me those messages. He just doesn't. I, sometimes I feel like Jeremiah, just, or just, just weeping all the time. Like, Lord, give me something happy. 
And he's like, no, <laughs> just I'm not going to give you something. I'm going to give you my word. So he had already been dealing with me. And the topic that he had been dealing, me, dealing with me about was his holiness. It was about who he is. And as I begin to study and I begin to dive deeper into who he is, let, let me tell you something. If you ever do that, it will mess you up. It, it, it will change your, your perspective on who he is. And, and that's what's dealing with me. It's not that I'm nervous. It's just I'm dealing with the holiness of God. <laughs> so I just want to say what he wants me to say. So if I, if I pause for a second or if I, if I seem to get emotional, it's not, it's not because of anything but of any reason other than it's him. And it's what he wants me to say. So as I was diving in, I, I found uh, a quote by somebody far smarter than me. And he said, men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their insignificance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. R.C. Sproul said that. I'll say it one more time. Men are never duly touched and impressed with the conviction of their insignificance, meaning they don't know how just small in the grand scheme of things they are. They truly are. Until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. So here, I have a title, if you will, if I could. And the title of my message this morning is Hiding His Holiness. Hiding His Holiness. What do I mean by that? I'll, I'll try to explain it as I go on. So the first person, the first instance that I came across when I was really dealing about, well, who, who kind of fixed this description that, you know, R.C., we're on first name basis, you know, R.C., that he that he explained, you know, like when you contrast yourself with God, you really see how magnificent he is and how insignificant I am. And I thought of Job. So if you'll turn with me to Job chapter 42, this will be kind of the base scripture that, I, that I'll, I'll leap from. So Job chapter 42, and to set the stage, if you know the story of Job and what happened to him, it, said, it is said in Scripture that he was blameless. He is, uh, God said this about him. He was blameless. He was upright. There was no fault in him. That even he turned away from evil. So it mean that he, it's not that he had, hadn't encountered evil, but every time he had encountered evil, he turned away. He was upright. In fact, it was God saying this to Satan. He said, have you tried my servant Job, who is blameless and upright and turns away from evil? And so all these things, I'm not going to go into it. All these things happen to Job, loses his family, loses his health, loses his land, loses his, his riches and his, his, his livestock, all of these things. He loses it, loses it, loses it. And his friends come to him and they rip their clothes and they pour ash on themselves and they're mourning. And then they, you know, obviously they sit there for a while and then they start to think, well, Job must have done something wrong. So they get into a massive argument that's like 12 chapters long. And then Job kind of, and I, when I say this, I mean, I read it and I'm like, fair point. You know, like Job thinks like I do, like God, you know, what's going on? You know, I don't feel like I've done anything. And you know what God's first response to him was? You better gird yourself up like a man. You better get ready. And then he says this, where were you when I laid the foundations of this earth? The first thing he says already contrasts himself. Job, you don't know how insignificant you are and how magnificent I am. And then God goes on this incredible, holy tirade about who he is. And then this is Job's response. Let's get into it. So Job chapter 42, verse 2, and we'll continue on to verse 6. It says, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? This is what God had said to him. Therefore, I have declared that which I do not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore, some verses say, I retract. Some verses say, I hate myself. Some verses says, I abhor myself. 
and I repent in dust and ashes. What an incredible response for somebody who was blameless, upright, and had always turned away from evil. That I had, I had come to some conclusions, God, about who you are because I've heard of them. But now that I am face to face with who you really are, I now understand and I hate myself. You see, and I started thinking, you know, I had never really heard the, the term repent in dust and ashes. I've heard of mourning in dust and ashes. I've heard of King David, you know, ripping his clothes and laying in the dust and the ashes and mourning and others doing that. His friends had just did that a couple chapters earlier. But what happens is they said that, I, I did some digging, and, here, and here's what I found out about that saying. It's a saying they used. So when somebody says, I repent with dust and ashes, and that's kind of like the short version of the saying, they said this, and it used it to convey a, a feeling of great disappointment or of disillusionment. So what Job was saying is, I had heard you, I had concluded things about you, but now that I see you, I see that I was delusional. This upright and blameless person who had always turned away from evil said, I was delusional to think I knew who you were. I was delusional to think I'd come to a, an understanding of you. So I have to repent. And see, here's the, here's the incredible thing. Job is not the only character in the Bible who had come to this conclusion. They didn't say it like Job said it, but they experienced it just like Job. If you go to Isaiah chapter 6, he has this incredible vision and he said, I, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, and, and then he continues on. He says, woe is me, for I am ruined. I saw the Lord, and I was ruined. I am unclean, and I am of a people of unclean lips, for I have saw the king. Or Ezekiel, along the same lines, has this incredible vision of God on the throne. And it's these, you know, fire is everywhere and these rainbows and there's these, you know, these beings that are like wheels upon wheels with eyes all around them and these angels with wings everywhere and faces everywhere. And they're constantly saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're saying these things, holy, holy, holy. And Ezekiel sees, sees it and he says, I fell on my face. And then you get to somebody like Joshua who's about to go into Jericho and then just the captain of the Lord hosts appears before him and he falls on his face. You see the trend? And we can go even, even into the New Testament with one of our great forefathers in Paul. When he was on his way to further persecute and murder the church in Acts 9, it said a great light appeared before him, and he what? Fell. And I know what some of you are thinking. I know what's going on. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, but that's old covenant, right? That's old covenant. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have, right? They didn't have that intimacy like we had with God. They hadn't had that. Well, this next person I'm about to talk with you probably had it more so than any one of us did today. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about John the Beloved. You see, John had been with Jesus through everything. He had even been with Jesus when they tried to arrest Jesus. Do you remember this? And they came to him and they said, are you who you say you are? And what did Jesus say? I am he. What happened? The soldiers drew back and fell down. So here's John who in chapter 13, was reclining into Jesus' chest. He, some verses would say, versions would say he was reclining within his bosom, just laying upon Jesus. So much so, if you read that chapter, Peter asks John to ask Jesus a question because everybody knew that John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I don't know if he gave himself that moniker, but it says it quite often in the book of John, that, I am, that, that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he was there in Acts 2, in the upper room. It says they were all gathered there together. Well, guess who was part of that all? John. John was there when the day of Pentecost, when fire came down and the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened upon them. 
John was filled with the Holy Spirit. So why am I setting the stage like this? Why am I saying, you know, okay, well, we get it. John was a part of all of that. Well, if you read in Revelation 1, when John was seeing this incredible vision, and then he sees Jesus in all of his splendor, it describes who Jesus is, how he is. And John says this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Much like every single other situation when a person of God met the reality of God. They fell. Their body couldn't take it. In other words, nothing had changed. His majesty hadn't changed. Our bodies hadn't changed. So the first point I want to make to you is that the revelation of his holiness should, keyword should, lead us to constant reverence. Should lead us to constant reverence. Why do I say should? Because oftentimes it doesn't. It doesn't. And I'm not, again, you see how, you, you, okay, so you're feeling this heaviness. I'm sure you do. I've been dealing with this for like a week. All right, just going to vent for a second. I've been having to hold this. Pastor Mark's up here just, just you know, like going off, bringing in fire. And I'm like a, a, a racehorse in a stall, like, get me up there. Like, I got to get this word out. God's been dealing with me about his holiness for so long. I got to tell you about it. Because oftentimes that should not doesn't happen. And how do I, who can we point to to see when that happens? Like who experienced something like that and wasn't constantly reverent? The people he saved, the Israelites. If you'll turn with me to Exodus chapter 24, and as you're doing that, I'm going to take a drink of water. This is talking about when the people of God are affirming their covenant with God. And so God, as he did a lot in those first few books, is giving Moses a ton of instructions on what to do. And we're going to pick up on those instructions. Chapter 20, verse 24 on verse 9. I'm going to read through 18, so the rest of the chapter. So here we go. Then Moses went up to Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. There was quite a few of them. And they saw the God of Israel. How many of us just skimmed over that when we read? And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, meaning he allowed them to see him. And they saw God. So they said it again, and they saw God, and they ate and drank in the presence of God. Now the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with Joshua, his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. But the elders, he said, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Ur are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, give it to them. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. So for six days, they could look up and see the manifestation of God's presence. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. 
And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. What a scene. That 74 people, roughly, saw God and ate and drank in his presence. And then when that was done and Moses went up the mountain, that that magnificent manifestation of God's presence hovered over the mountain for six days. Meaning for six days you could wake up and look and there's God. Wake up six days and look and there's God. Wake up for six days and look and there's God. And then on the seventh day, if that wasn't enough, a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Meaning it engulfed the entirety of the mountaintop. You wake up and you see that. Wouldn't that just lead you to be consistently reverent to him? But it didn't. Because when you look a few chapters later, I believe it's in chapter 32, that's when the golden calf happens. And you know what they said? They said, come make us a God who will go before us. Mm. And as for this Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, their mind is already wrong because it wasn't Moses who brought them up out of Egypt. It was God. But they said, since Moses is gone and he's the one that brought us up out of Egypt and we just, he hasn't been back for, you know, if if it really means 40 days and 40 nights, like a month and a half, or if it just means a very long time, Or in other words, since he hasn't come back and when we thought he would come back, I need you to make me a God. But just some, I don't even know if it was days, weeks, months, whatever, they saw God. But it didn't register with them because they had put all of their faith into Moses and not to God. So everything hinged on Moses and not God. And while they're having this experience, right, and it's not like Aaron was innocent. They came to him and he's like, all right, bring me all your gold stuff. Like he immediately started building them a God. While they're having this experience, God knows it, tells Moses, and Moses is like, okay, starts pleading on their behalf. But then this experience happens for Moses. Him and God start communing. And he says this to God. I believe it's in chapter 33. And he says, I pray you show me your glory. And God says this. I can't, you'll die. The real, what he really says is no man can see my face and live. And we, and we, it's a familiar story. He says, but I will show you my goodness. I'll put you in this cleft of the rock, cover you up. When I say it's good, I'll pull my hand away and you can see my back. But why, is that, why did that strike me? That if you see me, Moses, you'll die. Because of this second point. The second point I want to make is the revelation of his holiness means the death of flesh. It means that flesh cannot withstand who he is. You can even read later in Leviticus, again, when God's telling Moses how and how he wants him to build the tabernacle and build all this stuff, you know, the, just all these different areas and the holy of holies is what he's talking about now. And he says, Aaron, you can, he cannot enter in except for this day, dressed like this, anointed like this, prepared like this, or what? He'll die. And again, you can look at me and be like, yeah, but that's old covenant. But that's why I believe that John fell as if he were dead. Because yes, we have the Holy Spirit inside us. Yes, we have our soul. And that's who we are. But we're encapsulated in what? Flesh. So though the Spirit may be willing, the flesh can't handle it. The flesh cannot handle the magnificence of God. So the the interesting thing is that the Israelites, instead of 
knowing what they saw and trusting what they saw and letting it feed their spirit, they were operating out of the flesh. So they were having to live from moment to moment to moment, from experience to experience to experience. Never really getting it. Until finally a whole generation minus two had to be killed off before they could enter the promised land. In fact, when they did that golden calf mass, God instructed the priests to slaughter 3,000 of them. This is real, y'all. I say, y'all, I'm from the South. This is real. We don't talk about this. And when we don't talk about this, when we don't give that constant reverence, it's as if we're hiding it from people. It's as if what our flesh wants dictates what we do. And I'm not here to bash. Y'all, this is me. This, God had to bash this over my head for a week and a half because he had already been dealing with me about the holiness before Pastor Mark had come to me. It was in another version, another way of about being co totally consumed by him because he's worthy. But here's, here's an instance. I'm not saying these things are bad, what I'm about to talk about. But when we talk about God, we say, God, you're my provider. God, you are my healer. You are my banner. You are my shelter. You are my shield. Yes, 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 and yes. He is all of those things. But you know who he is before that? I am. He is I am. And what happens is when we don't first give reverence to the I am, we give reverence to the provision and to the healing and to the shelter and to the banner rather than just giving reverence. Let me tell you something. If he didn't do anything more for us, he did enough. Just because of who he is, he is worthy of praise and adoration. Because of who he is. Because of who he is. In Philippians, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 10, there's a moment that gets shared when it says when he comes back, when he decides to declare who he is to everyone, no holds barred, here's Jesus. It says that every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess. Meaning, it doesn't matter if you want to bow to him or not. Knee hits floor. Knee hits floor. Your flesh, I can say this, does not want to bow the knee. Does not want to bow the knee. But we have to come to a place where we are like those people who saw him and has to fall and say, I am undone. I am unclean. I had no idea. I thought I did. But I didn't. I thought I had it. But I was so far off. But there's purpose behind this. And this, is, this will be my third point. There's purpose behind this. And I'll just read Romans 5 real quick to you. 6 through 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners... While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm not crying because I want to invoke an emotion in you. I'm crying because a holy God who is incomprehensible, perfect, terrifyingly beautiful, 
surrounded by the most incredible creatures in the most incredible place, look down upon somebody who was dirty, destitute, and said, you can't come to me, so I'll go to you. So here, here's the third point. Here's the third point. This is, my, this is my last point, and I'll expound upon it, and then I will be done, and I'll quit yelling at you. The third point is the revelation of his holiness leads to a greater understanding of the magnitude of his love. Leads us to a greater understanding of the magnitude of his love. Church, and I'm not just saying Christian Center church. I'm just saying church, his body. We have been too cavalier with our actions. I might get reprimanded for this later. Okay. I have to say it. We have been too cavalier with our actions. We have not been reverent to Him. Yes, I understand that my life is not my own, that I've been crucified with Christ And no longer I live but him within me. And that when he rose up, he seated us within heavenly places. Yes, I understand that. But the attitude of Christ was though he was God, though he had that equality, he did not consider himself equal to God, but subjected himself under him. That is the attitude of Christ. He subjected himself unto God. And it even said humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. So yes, we have all the capability in the world. Yes, we have all that within us. But if you don't bring it before the king, before you act, before you do something, you're acting out of order. And again, this is I'm talking to the body of Christ. Because it's not just here, it's everywhere. We believe that we have been set free, yes. But Paul, this is why I believe that Paul says it like this. You used to be a slave to sin, now you're a slave to Christ. You went from being one slave (laughs) to another. It just so happens that being a slave to Christ means freedom. Paradox, I know, but it's true. But we don't act like it, church. We haven't seen him yet. Or we have, but it wasn't good enough. So we have to wait for the next moment. We have to wait for the next experience. Because, yeah, manna was good, but I'm tired of that. Oh, that quail was good, but, man, I'm thirsty. Oh, that water was good, but where are we going anyway? Egypt used to be so good. We are in a a beautiful yet dangerous position. We can either see him because we now have access to boldly approach his throne, which I have a hard time doing it boldly. I do it. I have access But how, uh, um, an author once said it like this, he is an unapproachable light beckoning us to approach him. How do you how do you do that? Like if, if the sun, our sun and our solar system was right there and somehow you had the capability to walk towards it, but yet feel all of the stuff you were supposed to feel, how would you do it? with so much respect for its power that you had no choice but to move with intention. To move with intention. Believe it or not, I love you guys. (laughs) And it's because I love you guys that I'm willing to share something like this because I'm a missionary. <laughs> what missionary goes into church and is like, you don't know his holiness. Please support me. 
Who does that? <laughs> so I, we love you guys. We really, and we love you enough to tell you, watch your step. Watch your step. Because here's, it, this is my final point. The reason I'm saying watch your step is because here in America, we don't understand kingdom. We don't. We go to places where influence and kingdomship is everything. Everything. They understand authority. They understand kingdom because they have a king. They have an emperor. They have a chief. They have a headman, And they answer to him. So regardless of situation, if the headman says do this, they do it. We have great, awesome freedoms in America, and that is a massive benefit, but it is also a massive ankle weight when it comes to the kingdom of God because there is no democracy in the kingdom of God. It is him and his word and his way, period. So I pray, I pray that you know what? I'll end it like this. I'll read Job's words again, and then that'll be it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I do not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore I retract. I, I, I abhor myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. Father, with unavailed eyes and with no motive other than reverence, may our hearts and our spirit and our mind see you so that we know how to move with intention. We love you. In your name, amen.